Um, my name is Shane Gibson again, Chief Social Officer of Socialized. We're a social media agency based here in Vancouver, but we've got clients uh, literally uh, that span the globe from Vancouver uh, to Toronto to New York to LA to, to India, actually. Uh, and that was an interesting trip uh, that maybe I'll share with the, the audience on a different note. But um, what, one of the things I notice about social media is, you know, the most common question I have is, you know, well, we're from my travels, is, this, is it up yet? Not yet, I'm waiting. Um, from my travels is always, well, but we're different, or our industry is different, or our region's different, or our company's different, or our customers are different. And one of the things I've found across the board is that that's just not true, that people are a lot more alike than they are different. And so I think this is one of the things from my lessons, traveling internationally, working with all kinds of different companies, both in sales and marketing strategy, um, is a lot of what you see that works can be transferred industry to industry. So here we go. Let's start up here. So leading the socialized enterprise. And I really do believe it's the message, uh, both uh, from Eric and Peter, that resonates with me is the fact that it is about leadership from an implementation perspective. So, and this is, I think, the most important thing I try to get across to, to marketers and, and teams, and Eric's comment about I want a million followers, is that social media uh, is not a video game. And I think that's the most important thing to realize, is that it's not about the number of likes you have, the number of connections. If I say, hey, I've got, you know, I've got, 30,000 Twitter followers, how many do you have? And John goes, well, Shane, I've got 382. But then I kind of, ha. And then John looks at me and goes, but three of mine paid me uh, you. And from that perspective, um, you know, John wins. So was that the Or out of range? Okay, I may walk out of range a few times than you guys. Uh, and so it's not a video game. So um, Peter actually quoted this study already, so I'm going to roll through it really quick. Um, but Brand Fog put a study out earlier this year. This guy's cutting out. Have I, uh, am I holding it wrong, or is it uh, it's just a different mic? Is it OK? We're OK now, OK. So you can't see these here, but you will see the deck online. We're going to I'm going to try this mic. How's this? Better? OK. Yeah, that one's better. So 94% of people surveyed said that, C, that, that CEOs and organizations' executive leadership team enhance the brand image by participating on social media. So that's an important thought from that perspective. In addition to that, 77% of respondents were more likely or much more likely to buy from that organization when the CEO and the leadership was engaged in social media. And 82% of respondents, again, were more likely or much more likely to trust a company whose CEO and leadership team engaged in social media. So I know we already went over those stats, but I think it's important to hear them again. Statistically, people are looking at our organization and saying, you know what? If your CEO and your leadership team are connected and dialed in from a social perspective, they perceive us as more savvy, more forward thinking as an organization, more trustworthy, uh, and in an industry perspective, leaders. And so that, from a branding perspective alone, it's a huge argument. Here's something else we looked at here too, is of the CEOs that were actually uh, interviewed for the study, here's statistically what they said uh, some of the results from participating in social media were. 78% uh, said that it was it helped with better communications. 71% said it improved brand image. 64% said it helped with more transparency. 45% said it improved company morale overall. 45% said it created a better leadership environment. And only 5% said it didn't do any of these things for them whatsoever. So most are experiencing, majority are experiencing significant business benefits being engaged as leaders. Here's another study which I found quite interesting. And this was from McKinsey. McKinsey did a, a very large global poll and study on social media. And here's some stats for us. What they found is there are actually 1.5 billion people social networking globally, okay, so involved in social networks. 70% of companies use social media or some type of social network technology that they interviewed, some sort of technology. 28%, 28 hours per week is the amount of time the average employee today spends on email and searching for stuff, knowledge workers, uh, and trying to collaborate using existing systems. And 90% of companies reported positive impact from a revenue perspective and business perspective from using social media and social networks. Now, here was the big number for me that was kind of, it's a, it's a big number, is what they found, they deduced that globally between 900 billion and $1.3 trillion of productivity and profit could be gained by organizations being more socially networked internally and externally. 
They found that 20 to 25% of this would be improved knowledge worker communication, collaboration, and efficiency. And 33% would be increased customer purchases and consumption driven by online social activity. So what they're saying is businesses worldwide are leaving a ton of money on the table from a marketing and consumer engagement perspective and from an internal communication perspective if they're not using social technologies effectively. Here's an interesting uh, study that was done by the Altimeter Group. Anybody familiar with the Altimeter Group? They're, they're probably, I would, I would argue, I don't know if you'd say this, Eric, but I would say that they're the number one social media analyst group on the planet at this point. Uh, and so, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, Jeremiah Al Yang, who's just Jao Yang on Twitter, J-O-W-Y-A-N-G, I believe. Yeah, um, he's a great guy to follow, and, and he shares these studies on an ongoing basis. And so what they found is that they interviewed and said, okay, what benefits did you receive from being involved in social as an organization? And they did an extensive study as well. And what they found is that 84% said increased customer insight uh, and engagement. 51% uh, said it improved decision making. 35% it actually gave them return on uh, help from an investment perspective. 32% said good financial impact. And 26% said it improved from an organizational development perspective. So what they also looked at is, how do you measure? And this is one of the questions we measure, is like, how do you measure social media? What are people doing, at least from a best practices perspective and measurement? Most organizations only measure one or two things. Yet there's many, many benefits to social media and social networks. So the first one, 44% said, you know, most of their most social media ROI measurement just comes from anecdotal. So Fred from sales, he tweeted this guy, the guy tweeted him back, uh, they met for a coffee, uh, you know, they eventually got in the boardroom, they pitched a deal, and they closed the deal, and those anecdotes are kind of social proof that it works. And that's how some organizations rely on it from a social media perspective. Then 44%, um, you know, looked at it from a correlation perspective, um, which really looked at, okay, it was more of a cause and effect measurement, or they'll look at the fact that, okay, uh, X increase in engagement is parallel to this increase in traffic on our website and this increase in sales. So they're looking at correlating trends uh, some just purely looked at links and click-throughs. Others were tagging and cookies. 32% measured from an integrated perspective. And what we're talking about is people who actually use social media monitoring tools like a Sysimos or Radian 6 and social media management tools uh, like a social CRM um, or a tool like Hootsuite, for instance, is how they were measuring their, their, their results. And then 17% just simply did A-B testing. So in other words, uh, this group of people that weren't exposed to so our social network had this purchase rate, and this that were had this one. And so there's a number of different ways people are measuring, and then of course this is direct measurement as well. So my suggestion is, number one, if you're going to measure social media, make sure you're using multiple methods of measuring it, not just anecdotal, but if you're going to improve it, for instance, you really want to look at integration. You want to look at A-B testing, for instance. So. Jay Levinson and I uh, wrote a book together. It came out in October of 2010, and it was called Guerrilla Social Media Marketing. And one of the things Jay and I did is we sat down and we brainstormed all the types of ROI that come from social media. And I think that too often we ask a simple question, okay, we've invested $20,000 in our social media activities so far, over and above staffing, let's say. Um, what's our ROI this quarter, financially? And I think that's, a, that's an important measurement, and eventually that's you know, what we're in business for, is to make money. But there's a whole bunch of other, what I'd call soft ROI, that lead to improved business practices, better engagement with customers and staff. So I'm not going to go through all of these and describe them, but I'm going to kind of walk through some of the different types of ROI that we want to think about when we're measuring success of our campaigns, our activities, and our ongoing engagement. So number one, reputation. Obviously, one of the biggest returns on investment from a social media perspective is reputation building and protecting. Number two is risk reduction. So from, I, I think about ING and the fact that you know, something could go wrong or that person could be complaining about what's happened from a mortgage perspective. And actually, you know what? We did do something wrong. Because we caught it and it didn't make its way to the bank ombudsman <laughs> or something else like that, um, you know, we're, we're better off as an organization. Risk reduction even from a competitive perspective. Client retention, of course, is another type of ROI. So not just the fact that you know, we've gained new business, but how many customer complaints have we handled? Um, how much more is our client educated and we're able to grow our revenues from them because of social media. Efficiency, of course, in communications internally and externally. Good business intelligence. Uh, differentiation. If, who here would say they're in a business that's almost a bit of a commodity? Customers are very price-focused, right? And so 
at the, at the end of the day, from that perspective, if you're truly in a commoditized business, then what's the only differentiator in most cases? Our relationship with our customer, right? And so that relationship, uh, from that perspective, can be very solid. So that's a big differentiator. Brand association, uh, PR and exposure, of course. Uh, I think about uh, George Moen, and I don't think him or Jillian Shaw are here, but I believe one of their first interactions was George identified online that she wasn't happy there was no power bar to blend coffee. And uh, he made his way down there and delivered it himself. Unbeknownst to him, she was actually in the media. And I can't say for sure that that's why Blend's got a fair bit of uh, articles written about them the, the next year in the Vancouver Sun digital section. But I'd say it was probably a contributing factor. And so even building those relationships and communicating with newspapers, with journalists online, can give us traditional PR and exposure. Immediate revenue, of course, is the other great ROI. Long-term revenue. Supplier capacity building. So what I mean by that is that often, you know, depending on our business, a big part of the value we offer to our customers, especially in the business to business space, is usually alliances, uh, developing partnerships with vendors, uh, and delivering really great solutions. And so for me, myself, a big solution for us, social media for me, is it helps me find new and innovative suppliers that helps me add value to what I do for my customers, for instance. Um, then, of course, we've got Perception, uh, perception shifting as well is a big one. So something as simple, uh, Ford, the reason why Ford started with the FordStory.com, I believe back in 2008, was, or, or mid-2008, 2009, was of course, we saw all these big banks and automotive organizations take government handouts in the US. And the perception was that all big three took the money, but the reality was Ford didn't. And so what they did is, but if you looked online for a while, people were tweeting about how Ford, Chrysler, and GM were just, you know, at the trough, and they were taking handouts, and all of these things. And so what happened is the CEO of Ford and their team launched a site called thefordstory.com. And what they did is the CEO went on there and explained that they didn't take any money whatsoever, that they were fiscally responsible, they were on track, and they didn't need it. And so they used social media to shift perception that was eroding their brand. And so this is another type of return on investment. More and better recruits. So today's highly digitally connected community and workforce, um, they want to connect with organizations that are connected, that are wired, uh, that are social. And so it gives us better resources and better recruits. Innovation, of course. Client education. Staff capacity building. Uh, if you've got your staff, if more than one person's on Twitter, but a whole bunch, from your development team to your technical team to your service team to your leadership team to your front line, and they've got access to information and networks. It grows their knowledge and their experience. Then, of course, we've got network growth in general. That's that reach Eric was talking about. Opportunity creation. Job satisfaction in general. Is that people today, how many people here uh, um, you know, would say you probably spend most of your day totally connected to this device, for one like it? Right? And most of us are connecting on a regular basis and communicating with those people around us. And we'll find that today's very social employee, if there's actually an environment where they're encouraged to be social in an efficient way, it increases job satisfaction. And then, of course, last but not least, is trust building. So I rolled through these really quick with you, and I, there's a whole chapter in our book, and I'm not pitching the book, maybe not too much, uh, in Guerrilla Social Media Marketing on ROI that explains each of these in depth. Uh, and I think the importance is when you're measuring social media or you're presenting ROI to the C-suite, I think it's important to educate them that these are all the ways that we can get a return on investment from social media. So who owns social media? I don't know if you know these guys, but I'm going to give you an example of a company here. Here's this guy right here. There we go. <laughs> That's an old snapshot of you here, um, but of your Twitter handle. But th from this perspective, the big question is who owns social media? And if I ask who owns social media to a group of executives, the legal team will go, we do. Because we should vet everything that leaves the company. And then marketing will go, hey, we're out there pushing the message, doing the branding, we understand the language, we should be communicating. And the sales team goes, hey, we're accountable for revenues at the end of the day. So we should be out there prospecting and connecting and being seen as thought leaders and elevating ourselves beyond the competition so we can get business. And the customer service says, you know what? No, actually, we should own social media because we're interacting with customers and handling complaints. And the R&D department goes, yeah, but we should be connecting with other like-minded organizations and collaborating, so we should own social media. And so the answer really is, is they're all right, that all of us own social, that the whole organization has applications for social media. And a great example, too, is, you know, so should it be just the leader who's ordained? Well, you know, Peter ordained himself, he did, uh, to tweet for the organization. Uh, but then we also, they also went another step further and, for instance, uh, create a Twitter account for the local Orange YVR account here. 
So there's the team here in Vancouver actually tweet to the community there. In addition to that, you'll find employees and leaders locally, like Mina Sandu on her own Twitter account, communicating with the community. And so what we found is that, you know, that layering and that highly social organization at all points does a few things. It reduces any type of communications bottleneck, but it also really, really humanizes your brand and increases ROI because you've now got, instead of one or two people, you've got an army of people within your organization who are out there communicating and contributing to the brand and the various business KPIs that they're responsible for. So I want to talk about just different generations, and I'm going to be a generalist here, so don't throw anything at me. Um, but I, I want to talk about boomers, Xers, and, and Gen Y. And um, I'm kind of, I'm going to have a little sort of personal disclosure here. Uh, I, you know, I'm considered, you know, a Gen Xer. Yet I grew up working with and being mentored by uh, my father uh, and other sort of senior business leaders that were in the boomer generation. And, and I find that, you know, if I look at a lot of the values, I'm, I'm more like them than actually are my, my co Gen Xers. Uh, and so I, I, not unlike the, the, the boomers, um, had, and originally had a very difficult time working with millennials, especially in the work environment, because of just a different value set way of thinking. I mean, you know, I'm like, hey, it's 520, where are you going? We're not done work. And they're like, oh yeah, we are. <laughs> I'm going to go enjoy my lifestyle and work on my health and contribute to society, and I'm actually doing it. I'm leaving the office right now. See you later, Shane. I'll see you tomorrow. And for me, I was kind of in shock. And so this is very different sort of motivation sets. But typically, I look at, at the baby boomers and just growing up around it and seeing what drove and motivated them, uh, and that was, you know, it was status. It was financial security. Uh, and it was, to a large degree, although they talk a lot about balance, uh, most of them work very long hours and are very much still today um, in, a, in a sort of work-to-live scenario, or live-to-work scenario. So we've got this group with a high work ethic who is very, very business-focused in the work environment uh, and put in the extra hours. Then we've got this other group of guys, Gen Xers, and this is kind of where we fall to some degree, um, is that, you know what, we're, we are big on lifestyle. But scary thing here is that although we, we tout that about lifestyle and about making a difference and being out there in the environment and all that kind of stuff, the reality is, is today Generation Xers work more hours than the boomers did at our age. Okay, so we're actually, we're actually in there working our butts off in many cases. It might be because we've got this massive bubble behind us and one in front of us <laughs> that we have to compete with to keep our jobs. So then the last one is our millennials and their different characters. And this is... Uh, you know, the age group that my son falls in. And uh, this is actually an older picture of him, but here he is podcasting with his class. Uh, I don't know how old, I think he was eight there, he's 12 now. But I think about the fact that today's, today's millennials have a whole different outlook. And I think it's something that actually has to be admired, that when they say, hey, you know what, balance is important, they actually mean it. Uh, they will actually will make sure they live a balanced lifestyle. Uh, they're not going to overwork. It has to have a bigger meaning than just a dollar for them. In many cases, cause-based initiatives by organizations. If your company has a purpose bigger than just making a dollar, it, if it very much resonates with millennials. The other thing that I found interesting is the minute they stop learning or they feel the value of their resume is not increasing where we work, they start to look elsewhere. It doesn't matter about the paycheck. If they go, you know what, I'm not learning new stuff anymore. And I'm not becoming more valuable in the marketplace. And I'm not keeping up with technology. It's time for me to leave. And so it is very much a group of people that want to be stimulated and connected and grow and contribute. So here's an interesting study. By, it was a stat I pulled out of time.com. It says more than half of workers in their 20s prefer employment at companies that provide volunteer opportunities, according to a recent Deloitte study. So and I think part of it is, is this term of digital natives versus digital immigrants. So who's heard this? term before, digitally as digital immigrants. So Mark Prensky actually coined the term, and he coined it, I believe, back in 99 or 2000, and it was actually digital, he wrote a paper, kind of a prophetic paper at the time, on digital game-based learning, and he coined this term digital native. And I think this is the reality, is that most of us, if we're born uh, before 1980, are digital immigrants. In other words, we weren't born with these things around. We kind of, I mean, I remember the first Amiga and getting on, you know, I was on the internet, you know, in, back in 1991, uh, and all the sort of the buzzing and the whirring and the machine shaking, and to, you know, to get on there and read some text. Um, but that, I immigrated into that world. And it was a very sort of foreign thing to me. And even the language of tech was foreign. And so for me, even though I'm highly social, 
not unlike the rest of digital immigrants, uh, we see these as a utility. These help us get something done. And this is why we use these tools in many cases. Where from a, from a digital native perspective, it's just part of them. My, my son was, you know, tapping these screens and hitting a keyboard before he could talk. And to him, the concept of not having connectivity or being able to search the web or communicate with friends or ping someone or upload something or shoot something or, or play a game on, on any screen he wants within an instant is totally foreign. And so the digital native is someone who is born into this environment, speaks a completely different language, and totally comfortable with it. And so from a work environment, we've got to realize that from a leadership perspective when we're trying to socialize the environment. It's also an assumption, and talk about being misquoted in the press, there was a Globe and Mail article that came out, I believe just online, I hope, um, last week, uh, and it was called Why You Shouldn't Let Your 22-Year-Old Employee Tweet, or something to that effect, and they quoted me in, in, the, uh, in the article, and I don't believe that whatsoever. Uh, I believe that, yeah, there's lots of really empowered young people who are very digitally connected because they're digital natives, but we need to mentor them, connect with them, and help them from a business strategy perspective to execute social, because there is a whole business side of mentoring that's needed. That's why hiring someone who knows how to use Twitter and Facebook and putting them in a cubicle and letting them run free with the brand is really dangerous. Is that we need to know how to lead them and realize that just because they're digital natives doesn't mean they're business natives. It doesn't mean they're strategy natives. So they're highly wired. So they're usually connected on one or more devices, devices at any given time. You know, they're watching TV, they're doing their homework on their computer, and they're texting their friends on their iPhone at the same time. So because of this just-in-time, quick, immediate, connected environment, uh, hyper sort of focus for short periods of time, bouncing all over the place, uh, they learn differently. So one of the things we look at is we're going to track this environment. If these people who are spending most of their time on the web, uh, they're highly connected, they're highly social, but we'll see that most, most people today, and I'd say that almost any of us who are in social do this anyways, but you'll see that you know, typically a table of millennials will all have their iPhones out of their or their, um, or their Blackberry, whatever it is, and they'll be chatting with each other and they'll be texting at the same time and think nothing of it. And that, they're just used to connecting that way on a regular basis. So then you stick them in a work environment where they have to do one thing at a time and they go through some type of sensory deprivation almost, uh, where all of a sudden they're not connected. They're not all of a sudden had a question and texting you to get the answer and then sharing some information with you and then getting some feedback and learning something at the same time. They're used to that. And so if we can, if we can sort of model that environment um, from a st corporate strategy perspective that are we teaching and leading the same way? So how are we going to track this group? Number one, make sure we're on web two-point platforms and networks, obviously. Realize that this group of people uh, are very time efficient. So with the interview process where you bring them back five or six times, uh, many of them are going to lose them. In most cases, too, they need constant feedback. Uh, they're very big on core values. So if we're tracking this group of people, they have to understand our corporate core values very quickly and know we're authentic, demonstrate a path for them. So they need to see a path. So if I'm involved here and I'm in this organization, what path am I going to be able to follow? What am I going to learn over this period of time? Also demonstrate a purpose. So this particular group, especially the millennials, are looking at what is the purpose of your organization beyond just making a dollar? What does it mean? What are your core values? What type of change are you trying to create? Now, learning. From a learning perspective, this group of people want bite-sized and bite-sized learning. In other words, they're more apt to enjoy learning through this interface or an iPad than they are sitting in a classroom for three hours. And so what we're looking at is how can we digitally deliver things in small bites from a learning perspective. So I know we run a course in partnership with Langara College on professional selling, and we do it all online. And what we found is that our, number one, overall the grades have increased over the classroom environment. Uh, in addition to that, we found that our students just complete the course. And in many cases, the average time that someone is inside the course at any given time, and this might be just be salespeople because they've got a low attention span, is about 20 minutes. So the average session, for, even though the modules are eight hours long, the average person is spending 20 minutes inside of that learning environment. And they still complete the course. So they want collaborative learning. They want to be able to learn something, share it, ask questions, get feedback in real time. Just in time learning as well. Um, sort of, and this sort of, I think back to the days of the cubicle. Now, this cubicle is many, maybe when I was in cubicle, and there was something called gopher training. Anybody remember what gopher training is? It looks like this. So you're in your cubicle, and you have a question, 
And so what do you do? You step into your cubicle, you look around, and I go, Flavio, <laughs> uh, how do I file that report again? He goes, oh, just do this. I go, thank you. And I kind of pop back down, right? So that's kind of old school go for training. Uh, but we're doing it digitally now, and people want to do it digitally. I want to be able to go into Yammer or uh, any other type of collaboration tool and pop a question to the team. How do I do this? And they're notified, and within an instant, one or two of them give me feedback, and I thank them. And I, then I'll go, hey, guys, by the way, I found this great report. Check this out. And I'll get a, couple, a little feedback from somebody else. All were doing something. But that constant collaboration can build momentum and really cross boundaries inter interdepartmentally as well if we start using these really social tools. Then, of course, it's social, and we've got to think engagement as well. So just like marketing is no longer monologue, neither is leadership and training. It has to be a two-way collaborative activity within our organization. So why is this important to social media? I know you're like, hey, this is Social Media Week, Shane. Why are you talking about internal collaborations? Well, most important thing in an organization, in my opinion, is over time to infuse a social DNA and a collaborative DNA in that organization, as Peter talked about, a, a culture of transparency. And I think that if you want to be really effective externally from a marketing perspective, you need to create a really social, collaborative, transparent culture internally as well. And so we've really got to understand these tools so that we're not trying to market like it's 2013, but lead like it's 1999. It doesn't work. So digital engaged. Here's a couple examples of organizations that I think are really personally highly progressive. I'm a little biased because they're both friends as well, uh, but I'm going to talk about their companies here. Uh, one of them, uh, Steve Jagger, and I'll just kind of call his company Steve Jagger because Steve's got five different companies. Uh, he's got one called Outsourcing Things Done. Uh, he's got another one called Ubertour.com. Um, then he's got another company um, called Payroll Hero, which is launched um, in Southeast Asia and doing amazing things. And, and two others, which um, I can't remember at this point, but he's got five companies. And Steve, most of the time, runs his business um, you know, off the corner of his desk at home uh, or up in Whistler uh, at his business partner's uh, place. Uh, or it might be uh, down in L.A. while he's hanging out and pitching venture capitalists for his deals. But he's leading and organizing his team globally in four different countries in real time, and he's highly efficient and profitable doing it. And what he's done is he's got a very talented young group of people that are surrounding him in these companies, uh, and this is what he uses for his major tools. He uses Yammer, which is like, kind of like Facebook, but just for a company. And you can go in and make a comment and ask a question and upload a file and interact, and he's used these internal Yammer networks in real time to communicate and stay up to date with what all the staff are doing. And I might be in sales going, I'm trying to close this deal with so-and-so. And then the guy uh, who's in Philippines on our team actually says, that's funny because I just noticed um, that there's an inquiry that came in from them from a support perspective from another uh, part of their company. So maybe we can get an intro there. And so all of a sudden that these people globally are now literally almost like they're sitting next to each other communicating. Wikis are big tools that he also uses. And one of the reasons why they do this is that if I go to Steve or um, Michael Stevenson, who are the CEO and president of those companies, and I say, hey, and I work there, I say, hey, Steve, um, how, how, tell me, how should I be running this Facebook campaign? And the first thing he'll ask me is, did you read the wiki? And I'll go, well, no. Well, go in there and look and see if there's anything in there running a Facebook campaign. So I go in and I realize, you know what? There isn't anything in there on how to run a Facebook campaign. And so Steve... And the team will work with me, but my responsibility is to completely document how that campaign was run and put it in the wiki. So the next time when someone else needs to know that, it's there. And what they've done is they've virtually and in real time built this incredible best practices manual for their company online through a wiki. And what happens is that also increases, if you want to sell that business, wow, what increase in volume or, or sorry, increase in value that is because all the best practices and processes are there. It's not stuck in the leader's head or the staff's head. Google video and audio, so what he'll, they'll do is daily, uh, they have like a Google Hangout with their staff basically every morning globally. So some of them are, you know, in the Philippines and you'll see their hair sticking up like this because they just, there's two in the morning and they're, you know, on the computer and other guys are in LA and some people are in Toronto or wherever else, but they're all in real time. They literally have a, a stand and sort of a stand up meeting uh, and chat like they're hanging out with the water cooler every morning digitally, globally. And then of course, social working is a lot of what, when I talk about that is that um, a lot of, their key stuff is when they do have face time with their staff, they don't spend it in boardrooms. They actually do fun stuff and collaborative stuff and, and things that really bond the team personally. So they look at the one-to-one -one time as more of a time to really, really build those relationships. Now I'm going to give myself a timer because I know I've got exactly, I know we started late, so I've got exactly 14 minutes here. So the other organization which I look at, which is 
um, Jeff Booth, and this is more uh, builddirect.com. Anybody heard of builddirect.com? So Build Direct, I don't know what the revenues are right now, but I think uh, when I met them in 2008, they were around 40, actually they were at $49 million a year in revenues, and today they're, they're pushing well beyond $250 million a year in revenues. So massive, high growth organization. Um, I don't know how many employees they have today, I know it's over 80. Um, Jeff will probably throw something at me here, I don't know the stats today, but uh, it's over 80 employees. They're based here in Vancouver. They're the largest supplier of building supplies in the world that's purely online. So they ship literally, I think they, they hit a billion cubic feet at some point here uh, in, in raw materials throughout the world. And so most of their staff, again, are this highly networked group of people in the millennial generation. And so one of the things they do from a build direct perspective is a big part of what they do um, is even some, something simple, like this is kind of a fun thing they did. Uh, at one point they were in the red. Um, and of course, you know, most businesses, especially these types of high growth businesses with cool periods are in the red. And they wanted to get into the black and be profitable. And so instead of having a glum meeting with staff and saying, okay, guys, if we don't get in the black soon and you don't pick up your numbers, you know, some of you won't be here next week <laughs> or the month after. You know that, instead, what they did is the senior execs all went out and rented these superhero outfits. And they created this whole theme in the organization uh, where it was they were going to squish the red. They were getting into the black. They were going to conquer it together as sort of financial superheroes as an organization. And they, they, had, a tr they had a sort of an on-the-board tracking of, of cost reduction and increase in sales. And they got the whole team motivated and involved in this. And so they really, from this perspective, uh, they didn't go the traditional path from a leadership perspective. They really made it fun and engaging. Um, another thing we'll look at is that a big part of what they do on a regular basis is pick various causes they support and charities they support as an organization and really do a lot of stuff outside of work together for the community. In addition to this, one of the key metrics that, it's not the first, but I talked to Jeff about this from a hiring perspective, especially someone in, in a sales environment, proactive sales, is he pretty well won't hire someone without, you know, there's some exceptions, unless he sees that they are well connected on LinkedIn and social platforms and understand the web because that's their business. And so this is one of the prerequisites for hiring. And then, of course, career mentoring is big. So Jeff sits down. He wants to know your five-year, your one-year, and your six-month goal. And even if your five-year goal is not to be there anymore, and he'll talk about how over the next couple of years he's going to help you get there. And he's really, really engaged in goal setting and actually not just about the job but about benefiting those individuals in their career. And they've got a very high retention rate and incredible, obviously, growth uh, and a ton of loyalty within their organization. So these are sort of a couple of examples of very digital and engaged organizations. Jeff, by the way, is also the most followed CEO on Twitter in Canada. Here's something interesting, and this is from Jeremiah Al Yang. He says, a technical recruiter told me some tech companies seek guild leaders in Warcraft. Why? Leadership in the digital environment just like work. So what we're finding is that while some companies won't hire you if they find out you play Warcraft, <laughs> uh, others are actually seeing the fact that you're able to digitally lead people virtually online, and they're actually recruiting people in the tech environment to do that. So get creative also in the way that we look for talent. So I think and this is sort of the message I want to I wanna finish with here, uh, or I'm going to wrap up with, um, is if you think you're a leader and no one is following you, you're actually just going for a walk. If you think you're a leader and no one is following you, you're actually just going for a walk. Anybody ever felt that way? <laughs> From a business perspective, you got this great idea. Uh, and then no one buys in, but a big part of it is social media is amazing, right? There's 1.5 billion people involved in social networks globally, but the only problem with that is that they all have the same noisemaker you have. And so in order to get above the noise, we have to be a leader. We have to have a distinct message and understand our market. And so, and uh, this is the fun part about using your phone to operate your PowerPoint, is that uh, people can call you in the middle of a presentation. There we go. So. Um, this model is one that Stephen Jagger and I did together, and I can't go through the whole thing today, but there's several levels of engagement. I'm going to walk through it really quickly here with you. Number one is we'll start off with people who are just disengaged. This is the person who still likes to use the facts, uh, you know, has a phone that's not smart, so to speak, uh, and really hires some, has hired someone else to operate their computer. They're not connected. So you're not going to reach this person with a blog or a tweet or a video. Then we move into the passively engaged, which is someone who typically go to cbc.ca because they... They're familiar with that brand uh, in the traditional marketing sense. They'll go to Walmart's website because of that. Uh, they'll go to your corporate site because you gave them a business card. So this person doesn't venture off, they're not very involved in search, and they just consume from traditional media channels online. Then the next group is reactively engaged. 
This is what I call your selfish surfer. So this person reads a lot, they consume a lot, they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook, they're on LinkedIn, but they don't create a lot of content, they're just monitoring. And in fact, many senior executives that call me, um, that's the first thing they do, by the way, they call me. They watch my video, they don't comment and say, hey, awesome video, and then they don't share it on their Facebook. They watch my video, they listen to my podcast, they read my blog, and then the phone rings and they say, hi, um, I'm on your blog right now, and I'd like to talk to, you, talk to you about working with you. I don't even know they exist to pick up the phone. And this is typically who this group is, so they're not sharing, and they're not giving you feedback, but they are consuming your content. So this is sort of the invisible group that actually, to a large degree, you can't measure that ROI on pure online basis. Then we move up to the proactively engaged, which is the person you, you meet here today, and by the time you get up the elevator, you get a request from LinkedIn. This person's hyper-networker, they're connecting with everybody. Uh, you put, they're the first person to share your content and comment and like and push it up in the rankings and all these types of things. But they're also one of the most frustrated marketers you'll meet because they'll sit down with their CEO and their CEO will go, what's our ROI on your activity? And they go, well, people like us. <laughs> people know who we are. Uh, I've got all kinds of love. Uh, but that's not an ROI. And so in many cases, they haven't done anything wrong because that first part is really important. Communications, connection, being liked, engaging. But the next step is really key, and that is being a thought leader. And thought leadership is a real key characteristic. And here's what makes the difference between a thought leader and just a content creator as well. Thought leader is number one. This is the most important characteristic. Write this down, is they listen. They're extremely effective at monitoring and listening. Okay, what their customer says. And but through listening, they intimately understand where it hurts, what they respond to, and what the customer wants. Then they have great conversations around those topics and also create great content focused on delivering on that promise. And thirdly, they create opportunities for people to connect and collaborate uh, well beyond just because of the brand. So I look at you know, an example of that. Uh, a great example of that actually is even Ford. Ford launched the Explorer, the last model or at least body design of the Explorer, on Facebook alone. And they've spent you know, a number of years curating and building that up. But from that perspective, if you go onto Ford, uh, on Ford's Facebook page, what you'll find out is that the, the majority of the people there are in there are communicating and talking about things beyond Ford. They've created a forum where people who love the outdoors, who love uh, who love their families, who are, there's a whole subgroup of people who are in there communicating about things beyond the brand. And the reason why is Ford's created an environment where it's really a whole community built around the brand, but not necessarily about the brand. And so thought leaders, this is a form of thought leadership. We've taken people from around the community uh, and connected them. And it's not about selling you anything, it's about sharing best practices. And you'll actually learn more from probably each other than you will from me after this session you're talking with each other. So a big part of it is bringing community together in some format, online and offline. So from a thought leadership perspective, what are you doing, number one, to make sure that you're listening to your customers, truly understanding them, having specific content focused on that, and then having opportunities to bring community together and do something bigger than just sell something to somebody. So I've talked about listening, and it's time. What time is it? It is, yes, it is exactly. So implementation, and then I'm gonna answer some quick questions here. So implementation, number one, when you start, the most important thing in my opinion in an organization um, beyond the strategy is social media policy and guidelines. And that social media policy and guidelines is gonna do three things. It's gonna protect your brand, it's gonna protect your employee from doing something that's gonna get them fired, <laughs> and it's gonna protect your customer. So really important to have a social media policy. Number two, social media training and mentoring and monitoring. So make sure from that perspective that we're training the people that we've said, hey, go forth and communicate with the customers. Don't just send them out there blindly. Third, crowd-driven ongoing education. Get a tool like Yammer up and active and start sharing your best practices interdepartmentally so you really, really grow that social DNA. Third, fourth, and this is actually, I think, first, is you need senior involvement in the organization. The C-suite must buy in and support it if you're gonna truly maximize the opportunity Lastly, it's gotta be long-term focused. It can't be, let's try it for a quarter. It is literally, let's build a social business over the next two to five years. And then remember, you attract what you are, not what you want. So if you want that highly engaged social employee that's incredible uh, interacting online and building business value, you have to be that company that they wanna come work for. So, to learn more, Here's where you can find actually this live blog right up here today is socialize.me forward slash social CEOs and it covers all three presentations. Uh, in addition to that, I just want to fill this, finish with this one thing. 
The quickest path to social media ROI I've seen is when people use the internet to get off the internet. So find ways every week to connect with somebody you know online and meet them in person, and you'll see that it drives depth and value in that relationship well beyond what the next 100 tweets could do. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, questions. Thank you. So any questions, quickly. I know we're all pretty ready to go, but any quick questions? Anything? Like this way? Hello? Hi. Hey. Um, how do you engage a, let's say, a CEO through social media that you've never met before, never seen, or never talked to? Now, are you talking your own CEO or just one of another company? Just another company, like when you're selling. Um, this goes back to, um, I think about how I, let's say I met, I didn't do it through social media, it was actually an email, but it's pretty close. Um, I think about uh, Peter Thomas, who was the founder of Century 21 Canada, and I got him to write the, he agreed to write the foreword of my first book on sales. And number one, um, I like to tell a story and I reason why I'm connecting with them, and I want to show them that there's a, a a irrelevance from a values perspective and business perspective. So I literally started by saying, hey, Peter, really admire what you've done in business. I love what you're doing from this charity perspective. I'm a big believer in this, and actually my book talks a lot about that. I know you're really busy, but I'd love to just get the book in front of you. And it was literally, so it's letting them know that it's not a generic ask, even if it's that focused. Like, I asked them for something right away. Uh, on the other side, if, even if you're not doing the ask, but you just want to connect with them, find something in common. So Peter and I, our commonality was we love leadership and we talk about it all the time. So I talked about leadership to him. I didn't talk about marketing with him. I didn't talk about um, you know, my business or his business. I, I found that commonality. Um, CEO of meetup.com, um, Scott uh, Hefferman, who uh, we interviewed for Sociable, uh, once again, I, I had to try multiple channels. So I tried to tweet him and I found he's a pretty unresponsive tweeter. He just kind of broadcasts a bit and talks to his family with Twitter. Uh, and so then I, I tried the email route through his company, and, and that didn't work. And, and then I tried on their Facebook page, and that didn't work. Uh, and then finally, through LinkedIn, uh, I got an introduction through uh, another CEO within Canada here uh, to talk to him on LinkedIn, and he finally picked up the phone and called me. And, we, and so I think the part of it is you've got to find what platform they respond on. It doesn't mean harass them, uh, but it does mean that, yeah, and I, for me, I'm always trying to immediately draw the commonality. And what I often tell people in sales with any cold call, my goal with a cold call or a cold contact is to get off the phone as quick as possible or not to waste their time or not to give them this giant email they have to read, but just generate some interest first and then ask permission to connect with them later. And I think that's often for me a good way to connect with the CEO. Other questions? Perfect. I think we're all social CE dote. I think that's done. We're done. So thank you very much. Um, we do have the Dragon's Den event here at 1 o'clock. So uh, we can hang out a little bit for about four or five minutes, but we do have to clear the room because they do have to set up pretty quickly for that. Uh, thank you very much for coming again. I hope you enjoy the rest of Social Media Week. There is a party tonight, a wrap party at 6 p.m. at Doolin's Irish Pub, and Molson's is buying the first 100 people a beer. Uh, so, you know, first come, first serve. Uh, but uh, those of you who want to come and, and network later, we'll be there. Thanks.